So, as we mentioned before, we have different transaction families included in this network already, which should run if, you, if the network is running. And there is a pretty cool one, which we, will, uh, we can have a look in, into the source code to understand how such a transaction family is um, built and see um, the different components of it. So Does everyone understand the concept of the transaction family now? I think they are going to understand this if we go into oh, yeah. it. Yeah. I mean, it's, that is the process. So more as, yeah. I mean, just talking about concepts is, is yeah. a bit different than seeing the stuff working and how it's made, right? Okay. So you already, perhaps, I, I think perhaps you already tried this comment. So here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, the other one is not, I mean, it's important if some, something goes wrong, but um, there's a lot of information, right? Um, so, okay, before, I think before we can talk about transaction families, we need to talk about the state. Um, Subject has a, a special way to store state. Um, does everybody know the difference between state and blockchain? Okay. So um, you can you can see here we have an address. You see this address is completely different from this address, and I think you can also see it looks like hash. Now let's just try something. Let us try to set another key. and have a look again into the state. So this time, you see there's something common at the beginning of this address. It is this part, and this part is specific to the transaction family. These addresses are, have a special namespace you can have a look um, into documentation. Three. Be here somewhere. Then yeah, lower state. It is it is a Merkle tree, and it is a Merkle tree with addresses. So each leaf has an address, and the namespace is has three bytes. So the six at the beginning, which is specific for the transaction family. And the rest, you have 32 bytes you can use, and it is up to you how you want to use these addresses. You just need to be sure that you use a deterministic way to calculate such an address, so you can uh, have access again, or you know where what you start. And also, um, yeah. also it needs to be unique, right? Otherwise, you are going to rewrite your state. So th this is something something you need to take care about in your transaction processor. The other thing, what we see here, uh, if you look at the state, is the data. And yes. So you have to define um, the first part. And um, how is there some way to prevent conflicts in the world that people say how is it the software that you stand right? Yeah. The, I mean, the question is the prefix, right? If you, if you, yeah, the prefix. Um, you, I think you can, um, you can create a conflict if you don't, if you don't um, have a unique prefix for your transaction family. <laughs> Okay, so the data, 
um, is also up to us how we want to decode or encode it. So this is also a part of the transaction family. It's called data model. And the last part is uh, the client. This is here in this case, this comment. So we will go and have a look at these three components, how they work for this transaction family, because it is a very simple one. Okay, so um, let's see, yeah, that's the story. Okay, so how is this um, prefix generated? Because <coughs> we need a unique one. So that's the way how it is generated. So basically it is just the hash of int key. So we can just see and you will see the first can can you see this it's so as you can see here um, that's how it's, it is generated this prefix So the rest is different, um, but we'll see this later. You can see it here. That's the definition of the of the rest of the address. So this way, um, we will have a unique address for each name. So we can't in this in this transaction family we are not going to uh, we can't set two times key one for example. It will because it will already exist. But it's also up to you if you want to. Um, yeah, it doesn't change. See if we can. Yeah, it doesn't change because it's already there. I think we have a message here. Yeah, you can see uh, now batches added, invalid transaction already exist. So, but that's also up to you if you want to overwrite or not. So that's how the address is calculated, or how you can calculate the address. Um, that's, you can all, always do whatever you want, but that doesn't make so much sense if you don't have a deterministic way to calculate your address, and uh, if you have some kind of collisions. How can we store data? So it is also up to us, like I mentioned before. In this um, transaction family, it is very easy. It is um, CBOR, I don't know if everyone is, knows it. It's a binary format. It is um, used like JSON. It, it is just a bit faster. And it ha it, you can use it in Python with just two functions. One is dumps, other one is loads. And yeah, this one, this one will, um, create from the state um, the data which we store. So we can also test this. We can see, for example, here, basically this is what I did. Here we have, um, sorry, we have we have here K1. We have this message, and I said just k1 is 1, right? This is something very um, basic to see. And then if you run it, you will see the same message. So that's, that's in, in this transaction family, that's how this transaction um, processor is handling the data. That's the data model. So. Okay, um, perhaps it makes sense to go to the Southwood repository. The core. Fun. Yeah, that's always fun. We are going to have a look at the version one. There is an, an it isn't the recent version, but um, our images are um, version one. So here you can find um, different integrated families, but 
the integer key one is in the SDK as an example included. So here, oh yeah, it's still too <laughs> small. Okay. I can read it right. So <laughs> um, yeah. uh, the good thing is these samples are in different languages. So it starts with C++, Go, Java, JavaScript, Python, so whatever you want. The best supported SDKs, I think, are at the moment, in the most recent version, are Python, JavaScript, um, Go, and Rust, which isn't included here because um, the Rust SDK is a bit, yeah, a bit newer and younger than the other ones, but um, it's already very good supported. And I think also the, the source code of Subject is moving now from Python to, to Rust to be more performant. Okay, so we are going to look into the Python one. Um, if you if you if you uh, know another language much better, or if you can't Python, you can look have a look at one of the others. The client will be not included in each one. I think the client is just um, included for the Python, but we now we are not talking about the client at this moment. We are talking about the processor. And here you can see we have a handler. And here you can see the, the decoding of, yeah, here you can find how the prefix is generated, how an address is generated by calling this function. So it's exactly the same in the content. That's basically where we have it from. You see, um, each transaction family will need these properties of family version and family name. So it is unique for each transaction family. If you run under the code with the same name and same version, it will uh, the real data will still call it. It's just there is the definition of the transaction family end. So there we have two very important methods. Um, one is apply. This will be called by the world data. And the world data will send the transaction and the context. Um, from the transaction payload, we can, I mean, it's not here, but I think uh, here. Um, in the transaction payload, we will get all the um, data we need, and then we can make a get state. This is also not the, not the um, function of, of the SDK. The SDK for Python provides this function, get state. This is an important one. That's how you get the state from the blockchain. So we, have get, we, we, need, we need the definitions of those properties and function. That's all we need for a transaction processor. So, and this transaction processor will uh, handle with get data and um, also with set data. <laughs> so we have get get state, sorry, get state and set state. So they are the most important uh, functions you are going to call if you write your transaction family or processor. So. Um, yeah, we can also have a look what it can do because it's not the only thing. What it can do is not just um, set. So we can also increase. We can decrease, and we can show which is which is. I mean, this is not the way you want to show someone data, right? So it makes more sense to have show and key one. That's how you want to have, how, do you, how you want to see it. So any questions to this transaction family? I, I can show you that the, I mean, this is the transaction processor, which um, isn't so much code here, but the client is a different story. Right? It, it's going to need, it's going to need um, to create the transactions and 
create the badges and send them and sign them and stuff like that. And the question is, who is signing? Who is signing these transactions? We made now. I mean, each transaction needs a signature, right? <coughs> so it's um, yeah, we, we can here we can have a look here in the badge about the signature. It is it is generated in the client directly. The um, key which we use the sign. Um, we will we will use another transaction family. Here we will need we will need players, so we will need to create some keys. This client ex um, wants to have some keys to sign transactions. The integer k um, transaction client has already a key included in the code it's because it's just a basic one to to play around. This one, the tic-tac-toe family, yeah, that's that's what we now going to do. This um, needs user. This this one needs player, but um, its source code is of course um, bigger. So the integer k family is a good one to study how a transaction processor is made. Okay, so let's start the, um, or let's play with the another one, uh, official transaction family XO. I think everyone knows the tic-tac-toe game. So let's generate, um, and let's generate two keys or two user. There's, there's no difference between a user and a key, right? A user is a public and private key pair. So we are going to create with south to command line interface a key for Alice and a key for Bob. So you can see we have the private public key pairs. So now we need to create a game, XO, a tic tac toe game. Um, you, can, you can see it here. Um, just let me copy and paste. Yeah, it's faster. Uh, it's faster. Yeah, it's not. So let's create a game with Alice. So Alice is player one, and she just created a game. Game, so we can again. I mean, we can always use the uh, REST IPE, and and we can always use the command line interface um, to see the state. But it's not well formatted because it doesn't implement the the data data model. So let's do it with XO. Um. So here we see there's one game, and I think we can also show the board. Um, that's how the board looks like, or look like. Ah, yeah, here we can show. I will show just. So let's have also a look here. Um, we called our game first game. So that's how it looks like at the moment. And I think this is, a, this is also the, the interesting is uh, the, the difference is, is interesting here because the first use of doing the, um, the state list command that's what's stored. That's what the state is, so that's the raw data. And then with your transaction family and uh, a client you're building an interface to that data. So you know you might have different formatting, different types of data stored in the state, and then the way that you can access that in a meaningful way is through the transaction family and through the client. Mm. I mean you see it is a different so, data model here yeah. for the for the tic tac shows thing. the same data but just Ah, this this to to show this one, you mean this board? Uh, the, the 
So the, the source code for the transaction family that implements this is here. So is the, the uh, here? Let's let's have a look here. Um, maybe first it's also do. So when we when we ran those first set commands, this was all you know the the initialization of that transaction family was done automatically by the script in the in the container that we set. Yeah. So. And if you want to look at the source code, you can see that. <coughs> Uh, so, so um, this, what you see here, this is um, included. The, the the encoding and the coding is included in this processor. So the, here is, yeah, it's always processor is handling the data model and 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 um, verifying the transactions before it it says to the world data, okay, you can put it into the state or in, or you can apply it into the blockchain. So it will be here. But the um, formatting of the information we get, it is implemented in the client. So it means, um, which is also part of the transaction family, the client. So it means this comes from the client and this is um, from the transaction processor. There was a question? Yeah. Um, so you said that the transaction family more or less gives context to the data. I, I will. It enforces certain. Um, Certain rules, and it also gives uh, gives context. Yeah. Yes, yeah, so it, it's all it's both a way to um, to enforce yeah to enforce certain processes and also to format the base data in a way that makes sense in the context of that of that family. Yes. So, but if I have this whole network and the other host is malicious, yeah. he could uh, make fraudulent. In the game. He could try to make two two plays um, after each other. You mean, for example? Yeah. yeah that, that's um, yeah. That, that's something your transaction family needs to uh, take care of. So it's also your implementation to make sure. I think um, we can try it now. We can now try to make two plays with Alice and see what happens. The um, question was that a malicious uh, entity in the network could be playing maliciously. I'm, I'm not going to I'm not going to do this for the first place because in the first place you also um, we, we didn't invite any player, right? If yeah. Alice now makes two plays, she will play against herself. So I um, will now make one play with Alice. She created the game. She can start. And then yeah. we can do. Yeah. And then also, it's a, you know, if you if you have a um, a majority of uh, of validators in the network uh, that will that they don't play by the rules in that network, then you have a problem anyway. I mean, there is only a set of that, that you can implement. Oh, so yeah, if you sure, I forgot. Yeah, yeah. consensus, which, uh, yeah. I mean, ideally, because it's a managed approach, um, you don't have that much of that, because you're not running this as a public network, right? Um, it's, it's managed, it's, a, it's, in, um, it's internal. So, but, you know, the, the problem remains that if you have a majority, a larger majority of malicious, Validators, you have some more problems than just <laughs> someone playing tic-tac-toe yeah. maliciously. Okay, so let's just let's just try. So we, we um, can we can show now the player one is so Alice is um, it is Alice's turn again, but we can try to play again with Bob and see if um, yeah if this. Transaction family takes care of it, so we don't see any message here to rest in the response, but we will see here something, and we will see that the transaction processor tells uh, the world data that this turn is not valid. <coughs> so if we look again, oh, we see also here the game. <laughs> I saw this before. Um, and this is where the where the logic enforces what you can and cannot do. So so you don't see you don't the, the, the see. Those are kind of different like the the risk modeling is at different stages. So one is at the network stage, 
with the actual in fundamental infrastructure and um, the data consensus and validation of data. And then the other one is your logic. One is can your network be attacked, the other one is can your logic be attacked. Okay, so this was another um, transaction family which you can look into um, or, or study in the in the repository. So, where you know? Add in your documentation, I see we launched a Docker is the sole client that we are running the well, we'll issues. Yeah. 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 yeah, so I mean, we're, we're going to that work shop, work let's show, let's show, let's show here again. Oh, sorry, the container we have running, and you see we have a container. I mean, just 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 um, tell me if, if it goes my answer goes in the wrong direction for you. <laughs> Um, or if it doesn't answer your question. Here, um, this is a transaction processor. And this, in this transaction processor, not the client is running. The client is running um, just if I type XO and so. Just then the client starts, does um, the job, means sending to the world data the transaction. And the world data then calls the transaction uh, processor, which is running all the time and verifying um, the transactions. So that means the... the <coughs> for this specific family. For each family, actually, um, it's yeah. always the processor is always running. Yeah. And so the logic, if a transaction is valid, and in our case, it wasn't valid because someone tried to play it two times or twice. Um, yeah, it, is, it should be here. Let's see if we can find the error message directly in the source code from here. So it tells not this player's turn. Let's see. If, yeah, here it is. So here is the logic. I would say if you compare to the Ethereum, the transaction processor is the smart contract. Yeah. So from the idea, but it is actually. It's more yeah, than that. Yeah, it, it's a transaction processor is not an isolated component you, you see in subject. It is more part of the transaction family. And so um, it includes also. The client, because um, creating the batch, signing the transactions, also part of the transaction family, and also the data model, which is actually in implemented in the processor, of course. Then if you compare also Ethereum, here you have just one Docker, that means it's a processor, and then you have a manager redundancy. I would like to have a uh, large redundancy in all the procedures. Yeah, good question. The question how is, can you, uh, how can you make it's about redundancy stability. for the uh, transaction process? How can uh, redundancy for transaction processes be achieved? Uh, so you can have uh, multiple processes for the same transaction process that are running on the And different doctors and different options of payments registered for the exact same transaction processor. And what that the advantage of doing that would be when you have multiple transactions coming in for the exact same transaction processor. So there is no dependency between those uh, those transactions. Uh, validators, the validator will schedule them for processing parallel. Send them out to all the other Yeah, problem. Let's imagine you have uh, if you compare to smart contract, I have uh, 20 running and I have one hundred nodes. Here to implement it here, it should be really uh, Imagine I have 20 small contracts, so here like 20 transaction families. Transaction families. And I want to run it on a network with uh, 100 nodes. It would be really a nightmare. Yeah, but you have to do how you want to pack it. I want every single one in a separate container, then yes, you will have a nightmare. You could have all of them running in a single container. Yeah. And also, or you could have the, the validators spawn um, processes uh, at runtime. We, we are we are going to we are going to run a transaction family very soon without the container. Uh, all the same. I'm going to kill the container for integer key and run it directly in with Python um, somewhere else. You cannot, I mean, you don't need to run it in a container. Also, it's not exactly the same as a smart contract in, uh, in say, Ethereum. It's, uh, 
because you know it's much more extensible and you can you can do more with that. You can build in a transaction family, you can build a very versatile uh, execution environment that takes care of you know what you would need several smart contracts to do. You don't have you know you don't have uh, the gas limitation anything like that. You can build um, you can build things into a relatively complex infrastructure. So it is not this it, there are some similarities, but it's not the same as as this uh, smart contracts. Yes. Um, I've heard They they have they need always a version for parity defined because the well data if it gets the transaction it will look for the transaction family and the version. Okay, so these phase transaction family processor and the version. Yeah, yeah. 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 Um, <coughs> it would mismatch if you would see transaction processor as a comp isolated comp component, but because it is a part of the transaction family, which also includes the client, and the client is handling the creation of the transactions, which also includes the version number, they should be all fine. There's a question. Do you want to specify for giving <laughs> for the same valid, uh, for, for different validators, there can be different sets of transaction families uh, accessible. That was the question. Yeah, the the well data typically gets a transaction if it recites a transaction. If your client really sends to a well data transaction which doesn't have the transaction family, it's going to do nothing. It's no, going the to. The question is whether you can do access rights, right? Mm -hmm. Not about the access rights, just that you have kind of two different, let's say, configured validators for, for their own campaigns, that are both um, doing those transactions. Because I, I see now the transaction family kind of um, what can the validator process. So this, this uh, what, 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 what is a value of processing, which kind of transactions I want him to do. For the for the specific world data, which will, after the block is created, will sign it. Every single validator has to be exactly the same. You can't have one validator with some conduct and some validator. Yeah. Because the reality is that if you want to build a chain, you can block a validator of that paper. It has to be able to process every single conduct in there. Yeah. If you want to have transaction processor for that transaction. So you're doing, you're doing. Uh, if you want to do access controls, and um, you do that in, in the logic itself, you do that by key. Um, you can also do stuff in the client, and uh, in terms of you know what the client is going to be sending transactions for. Technically, there's different layers to implement that, but it would be like we like we did with Tic Tac Toe. You can't do a second transaction. If you just done a transaction with that key, um, it's going to well, you can do it, but it's going to fail. Similarly, you would implement um, no, it, access control by key. But it actually, the world data will just tell you it doesn't, it can't reach the the specific transaction processor it needs. Yes, please. So can I just correct you? I'm trying to see the uh, on the higher level tier system, but providing kind of Yes. Yes, and the extensibility comes. So everything is the same, but like every validator is the same, and makes the same decisions, and uh, allows the same transactions. Um, but then the, the this is where the transaction family comes in, and the, the transaction processor, because the processor is then the one that. Uh, that you can use to stratify that, um, that behavior. So you can send a standardized transaction, um, and a validator will uh, will process it. But then, for the interpretation of what is in that standardized transaction, 
the transaction uh, the process that is being used and called, and that is the specific behavior. So it's it's a uh, diversification environment that sits on top of the standardized infrastructure. Does that make sense? Yeah. 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 It's, only, uh, it's only questions like uh, really, really really feet, yeah. 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 Sure. Yeah. Thanks. Okay, so you can you can also go to the documentation. I think this tic tac toe game is very very well described. Uh, in the documentation, you can see the data model here. It is different um, and very simple. The addressing is also a bit different because they have not just the prefix, also the game name is also there. I think this is also a good one to study. Um, not from not just from the view of um, transaction processor, because also, um, also for, for the client, because it's very well documented. And it's documented um, in different languages. So, yes? So how is that accruing? Uh, can you speak up, please? How is it accruing? How pruning? How is it pruning? Um, in the state tree, in the state tree, you don't have any invalid transactions in the state that just get, doesn't go into the state if it is not valid. Yeah, but they inside, they don't need anymore. If you you mean if you can tell it, you, if you can remove something from the state, yeah. yeah, you can, but it will still be in the blockchain, so you don't really, uh, you don't really. Get, you you can't you can't remove anything from blockchain. Yeah, because it is just a new transaction. So the, this, the state gets built by processing the transactions, yeah. and then the state is, uh, you know, it's a tree. So if you know that a certain uh, branch is not going to be important, you can prune it from the state. But you know, like the state is not the the ultimate. Um, the, well, it's not the ultimate truth. It doesn't. Uh, but the, it, that lies in the ledger of transactions. Yeah, but I don't need certain uh, uh, blocks. Well, I mean, it's an append only, like the blockchain itself is an append only. So you can't go back and take out a block. And because. Okay. The, I mean, I guess you could do, you know, like in your own implementation, you could do something like that. But I mean, one of the ideas is that you, that you can replay everything and you can go into each point in time and check the state as it was then, and you have a full. Uh, a full record of all the things that have happened. Yeah, we, yeah, we, we could flag it as we don't need this because I come from the state, so we don't have to have a can if you want to, but you can uh, leave it and you still have the same state as everybody else. So that would be the idea of a light client. Um, you could technically build a light client um, where you can flag blocks that are not necessarily so relevant. Also, the, this would be, I guess, a light node. Um, I mean, you could technically do that if you're in a trusted environment. Do you guys have light nodes? Are you planning light nodes? Are you planning light nodes? Um, it's on the backlog, yeah. but on the census node, including the census, but just being observed kind of yeah. And it's not entirely necessary because as a client you don't need to run a node. Like you're you connecting to the node from the client. So the node can be a PC version that has a full record, and the client, like the way that the user would interact with it, is not having a node running on their machine. So so now we decide I'll never need to uh, see this game ever again, and it will be in my future states. And the transaction says it's now irrelevant. And then everybody who's built up the state to that point, he knows that we're effectively 
No, no, that, that is that is the, that's the idea behind the blockchain, right? You don't you don't want to remove any, or be able to remove any block, any transaction. Yes, you could you could uh, implement some. You can implement a node, a light node, technically that only um, uh, stores some stuff. But the idea is that at least somewhere you need uh, you need to be able to reconstruct how you got where you are. So the idea is that at least somewhere there needs to be a full copy. But this is an interesting problem. I, I don't necessarily want to go too deep into this. It's a very specific use case. Um, so we can continue the discussion on the Yes. Exactly. Okay, let's have a look at the. Uh, You you need you need to talk to the REST API, so, so also which which has a okay. you can just you can just ask. I mean, if this is just about getting information. Um, if it's too bright, so it's basically I I open my lab and I need to validate that I get the right. But the the well data so will have. Trust, I trust the full nodes, which is fine. I was yeah. just wondering if you were exploring because there's this whole trend of light plants which are not. I mean, <laughs> I know it's not the same. Would we have these clients So you, you just craft it and you send it to the validator. You send it to the node that you're connected to. So you craft it, you sign it with your key, you can do that on your phone, and then you send it and it gets included in the batch and it gets included in the batch. That's a thing. Well, it's just, it's just a plan. <laughs> so this is, this is kind of the, that's the idea of the, the client. So it is that you don't have to run it on, but you connect it to it. So, um, identities, the private keys are not stored, stored in the validation, right? No, the, 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 yeah. the keys are stored locally. At the client. At the client. The so, private key of and what? For, the of my for to yeah. your transaction, yeah. you, you will have your private key. So, so you, you, that's right it. Now it's basically yeah. already part of my client. Yes, exactly. I own my identity and yes. my key, but I don't store the ledger in the validation. Yes. Exactly. But a validator can obviously can't then uh, create a transaction in your name. You craft the transaction, which is obviously not very yes. computing intensive. You sign it, and that's it. Yeah, but technically, I go through the transaction processor. No, so you, you well, you you act on the state information that you have, and you then craft the transaction. And obviously, you can you know there are interfaces that will, that will create it for you. So you know, obviously, you don't have to write the implementation when you're calling a function, but basically you craft a transaction that fits the transaction processor, yep. and then the validator calls the transaction processor. And the transaction processor would like 
find out about the mistake? The transaction processor is um, just verifying the transaction. Yeah. So it will respond to the validator, which will do a request if the transaction is valid. Like in our case, if this um, play was, for example, if this play was valid or not. No. Um, so it just sends uh, or declines sends in this case my play, which I tried. Um, to the world data and the world data sends this transaction to the to the um, transaction processor. Like, it would take the string and write my signature and then I'm ready. Yeah, your signature is already in the transaction, right? So, uh, so that's the best client does that, yeah. And then the validator just gets the transaction. And so the validator, the first step checks whether the transaction itself has the right format. Yeah. And then it checks with the processor whether the Commands that are in, in, the trans uh, in the transaction data, whether that makes sense, yeah. and then they then it gets added, and then you the node itself updates the state. Yeah. Okay. So let's have a look at the next uh, next transaction family in our list. Um, want to cover? This um, is the identity transaction family. We didn't talk about permissions and subject so far. Um, this transaction family is integrated in subject to handle to manage the permissions. And we will see how to define a policy. There are two main keywords you will need to use. And you can find in the official documentation the specification for the tran this transaction family, but uh, I didn't find any Example how to use it, so I think you will see it first time perhaps. So let's have a look. Okay, so the first thing um, this this network we are running at the moment doesn't include this transaction family. So it's the first case now we can add a transaction family, but we do it with a container. So the same way the other one. We, we will also yeah yeah we yeah. will. Just do it so again. Okay, so. <clears throat> it's just so that we can actually do anything today. <laughs> so let's first um, stop this network. Um, you, can, you can't just um, add a container with Docker Compose on a running thing. So. But I could add a new container without having Docker Compose. Yeah, sure. You, can't, you could start it with Docker yeah. with a container and, and um, point to the, to the network. To do network. If I modify the junk file and just do Docker Compose up again, would he recognize that there is a new container which is not running yet and just edit? Um, I, I, I would not assume that you, I, I mean, I would not use a Docker Compose uh, file or for your network. Yes, yeah, sure. So, so, so uh, for testing. Yeah, for just, just for testing. Uh, I mean, what is very close to that is Docker Swarm, if you want to use uh, manage your network in, in a similar way. But. Uh, if you run up again, then it takes Okay, so, so let's do it. Let's just copy this and paste somewhere where we want. So, because the order of execution is also um, Set by depends on, so it will not start before the world data starts. Let's save this and start. Oh, you will always uh, make sure that if something doesn't work, that you do a Docker compose down to be sure that every um, container is stopped and you have no conflict with volumes. So there was a recommendation from oh. there to that there is a, there is a script to shut down all of the Docker containers that might be running. It's very easy to still have a bunch running. Yeah. <laughs> so and they just run through the daemon, so you don't necessarily see that unless you, unless you know. So the YAML file is um, very sensitive to space. You just have the And it's the same no, no, you are not going to. You are not going to. You are not going to run your network with Docker Compose. 
just that's for words, but that to me, it had some truth. If you add it manually, then you can, you can also add it in, but uh, this is because the, the compose file needs to run for it. Let, so let, let's, let's, it let's start the, the after this, let's start the in, integer key family directly from, uh, not from Docker, directly from the command line. After so, lunch. After lunch, then I will, okay. Uh, why do we get, uh, because I have it already, or what? Maintained by real data, specific um, component for that is the journal called journal, and it has also sub components for uh, in memory keeping the state in memory or keeping the ledger on the hard drive. So. <coughs> for that, there is another component in the real data called completer. <laughs> <laughs> so it's just responsible for that. It's, it, there are very different components um, which makes it. Um, it should not. What's the error? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so, um, I don't know why it doesn't want to. Okay, let's stop everything. I mean, in worst case, I can just change the container name. This is the conflict, but the comment to see all container, even the one which I stopped. No, Docker PS and then which flag? Not not everyone at the same time, please. Okay, minus A. Just minus A, thanks. So okay, they are still here. Okay, now it should work. So, it's running. Um, so, uh, we are not in the command line anymore. We are kicked out. So, um, it, there is something specific. That's what, what I mentioned at the beginning. Uh, the Genesis node has specific permissions, or more permissions than others. And one of them is, um, if you do a configuration change on on chain with this subset command, you can you can also look for this command in the command line interface reference. Then you need the signature um, of the of the Genesis node. So. 
that's why we are going to do run this command in the world data. So we are going now into the world data container. And there we want to make a proposal. Um, usually you could vote about this and um, in our case we have just one real data so it doesn't need any um, anything from others. It's, we can just run this command and it will be accepted directly. Um, here the, the idea behind this comment is to give us um, to give us the permission to create identities, uh, not identities, roles and, and, and policies. So we have to add the key from the client in, in, this, um, in, in the chain to, to tell everyone, okay, it's okay that we have the permission to change something. To get this key, we need to jump into the shell again. And we have here in the root, we have keys here. So the root is still too small. So this, these keys are generated um, by the Docker Compose file if the container starts. Okay, let's copy paste the content of the key. So, I have to copy this and add here. And now we don't get we don't get any message here. If I, if I just write something that doesn't make any sense, it will still not tell me that I did something wrong. So you have to check it here. You see here a validation of a new block. We made a change on chain. We changed the setting. Now the um, command line interface user or key has has um, permission to create policies and roles. So is everyone so far? Okay. So you need the private key. I mean, you can you can use which private key you want, but we take the one which is already created in the shell container. You, you need the you need the public key. Yeah, yeah. You don't you don't share your private key. Yeah, yeah never share. <laughs> no, but, but I mean in this scenario it will be kind of if you need to give your private key to the world data it will be a uh, broken uh, workflow, right? <clears throat> okay, now um, we can now we can create a policy. And let, let's first try and then talk about um, <laughs> how this policy works. So here I am in the shell. So we now we can use the we can just close the world data. We don't need anything from the world data anymore. That was just this this small setting we needed because um, yeah because it was the genesis world data um, with more permission than us. So here. We can uh, create such a policy, this first policy. Yeah, 14 milliseconds. And now we have this uh, policy, define this policy. What does this policy mean? So we have, we have, <laughs> we have, we have two, two kinds of keywords, permit key. And the other one we have is deny key. I think here, deny key is all. What do you think? How? how yeah, please. What, what do you think? How? Uh, how would transactions uh, mm -hmm. signed by the private key of the company? So the, the the star means all in this case. In this in this, in this case, anyone. It is a boring policy, right? Everyone can sign transactions. If you do. Uh, so, to identity policy, 
Let's see. <laughs> List, okay? And to see what you will. Okay, so it doesn't work. <laughs> it doesn't work. It is a bug in this version. It okay. really doesn't work. So. Is policy loyal to that mode, or is that share This policy? Yeah. This policy is on chain. It's yeah. on. Okay. But you could imagine like policies or. I mean, the policies are defined for the network because we have also predefined roles. Which, which or names um, we, we we will we will use. Um, yeah, we, we, we we have transactors, for example. We have a different role. Um, there are different roles, and we can uh, we will we will um, define this for for the whole network. Always. So the policies will be shared across all the networks. We could have policies that are specific for that particular network. For example. Say that client alias okay. allows to way, uh, submit a transaction. This is the reason why we just have this one. But if we submit that transaction to you, you won't accept it. So by default, that there is a policy no one can send anything. <laughs> no, by default, the policy is that what we defined. This, this is the default policy. It's the most boring policy you can imagine. Yeah, anyone can. <laughs> uh, if you want to be on the safer side, you can set it by default. You could whitelist, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Well, well, you, you. well, I mean, you would have to uh, off chain define the connection between um, I, the, the key, key and what it is. Yeah, sure. sure. I mean, you could store it on chain, but the idea is you know, you, it's, it's pseudonymous. Sure. Um, so you have to then define you know, what that means. Oh, sure. Yeah. So, 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 uh, you can, by the way, you can you can um, define such a policy that no one can sign a transaction and apply that to the network. So you can just uh, kill your network. <laughs> so, that's possible. So it's, it doesn't prevent you from that. That's the RMR, not the RMR. Yeah, you just break it. Okay, so um, if you look at the policy, so. Um, yeah, the, this policy allows everyone to sign transactions, which doesn't make so much sense. Um, what we can do is we can combine we, we can combine these two keywords to specify our policy, and we just need a space between them. So uh, we could try a second policy, and we can't say okay. Um, I think I have no, I don't have it anymore. Um, Yes. Sorry, what was the question? Yeah, it, it, it was it take... meant to do the deny all, or oh, yes. allow all. Yes. So, um, let's do a policy like that, where we say only I can, only I can, only I can uh, sign a transaction. So now, um, perhaps you are not in the right container. Okay, I have some tissue here. So you see, we can we can just do it with space. <clears throat> so something like that. 